Welcome, everybody. It's Tuesday, October 21st, 2014. And we're talking to John Lee Dumas today, host of Entrepreneur on Fire, which interviews a different entrepreneur seven days a week. You can check it out at eofire.com. He's also the creator of the website podcastersparadise.com, which is a tremendous resource for people who are interested in getting started in podcasting or for people who are veteran podcasters and want to go to the proverbial next level. John Lee Dumas, welcome to the show. Tom, I am fired up to be here. John, you have got such an extraordinary story. There must be times in your life where you yourself almost <laughs> can't believe how your life has turned out. But I want to save that for later. I want to save the punchline for later, the income reports for later. <laughs> I want to give people something to look forward to. I want to start off by noting that I had Mark Sisson on my program just a few days ago for the fourth time I've had him over the years. And thanks to your interview with him on Entrepreneur on Fire, I had a whole new vista of questions I could ask him. Instead of just health and diet and exercise, I realized his personal story is fascinating of success and failure and incredibly hard work building up a brand. Now, your own story, I think, has involved some failure and some success, but I want to start off specifically with the podcast, Entrepreneur on Fire. You have had now over 700 episodes with a diverse array of guests, and yet I bet after all those interviews, there are some common themes, right? There are some themes in common where you say there seems to be something that all these diverse entrepreneurs have in common. What would that be? The one thing, Tom, that just comes up over and over again is mentorship. Every single one of my guests that are successful and aspiring entrepreneurs to a T, every single one of them have invested in themselves at multiple times in their journey in mentorship, in that person that is where they want to be. So that is just a critical part of every entrepreneur's journey, and it was a critical part of my journey as well. Your show is seven days a week. I don't, I don't know that many podcasts, but that does seem unusual. <laughs> do you ever worry, this may sound like a trivial question, do you ever worry you're going to run out of guests? How do you find all these guests? <laughs> that was the number two question that I got when I first launched Entrepreneur on Fire is, John, where are you going to find all of these guests? And it was a slight concern for me as well, but I will say it about the year point, Tom, and now we're past year two, I hit this tipping point where I actually get a hundred plus inbound requests of very legitimate guests to be on Entrepreneur on Fire every single month. So more than three times the amount of who I could actually have on. And so now it's kind of a full-time job for one of my virtual assistants to kind of siphon through the application process that we have for Entrepreneur on Fire to find the top 30. That's astonishing. That's wonderful. I, I get recommendations a lot of times too, but I've never had that number. Of course, because what you're doing is not only telling a great story to the general public, but you are also, of course, as a matter of course, publicizing what this person is doing. Everybody's happy. There's nobody <laughs> unhappy at the end of this process. So you got started doing this I guess it must have been 2012. Yes. You didn't have any background in broadcasting, did you? Zero background in broadcasting and zero entrepreneurship skills whatsoever. None of my prior careers had anything to do with that. Now, this is what I wanted you to say that because I have people who listen in and who would sort of like to try to do this themselves, and they feel like there's some kind of secret knowledge that only entrepreneurs possess or only podcasters possess they could never get hold of. But your story is one of a guy who spotted an opportunity, and my gosh, did you ever spot an opportunity. There must have been other podcasts doing something like what Entrepreneur on Fire does, and that didn't discourage you? It didn't discourage me at all, and the reason is, is because I was a consumer of just those podcasts, Tom. I was listening to those podcasts that were doing something similar to what Entrepreneur on Fire now is, but the one problem that just kept cropping up over and over again was lack of quantity. I kept running out of these podcasts because they were doing it, but once a week, twice a month, maybe two times a week. And I had to ask myself, where's that seven day a week podcast? And it just didn't exist. Give us some names of some guests you've had we would have heard of. Now, by the way, they're not always the best uh, interviews. A lot of times people you've never heard of <laughs> turn out to be the best interviews. But who are some people my listeners might have heard of you've talked to on Entrepreneur on Fire? 
So I've had Barbara Corcoran, who's a great guest on Shark Tank. I love had, Shark Tank. <laughs> yeah, she's amazing. I've had uh, Tim Ferriss, Gary Vaynerchuk twice, um, Chris Brogan, Guy Kawasaki, Brian Tracy, um, T. Harv Ecker. And, you know, I, I just, it's been, it's been a blessing, the, the amount of incredible guests that I've had. Um, and those were just a few of, again, over the 700. But to your point, Tom, and you couldn't be more correct, those were amazing interviews. And those were great guests and great names to spout off. But oftentimes, I find my best interviews for Entrepreneur on Fire are those lesser known entrepreneurs. And that's for a number of reasons. Because with my personal Entrepreneur on Fire interviews, I really want to focus on the story. And I want my guests to share personal and really gripping and moving stories. And those that really prepare for it and actually have one that's ready and they know what's coming and they just deliver it with impact and emphasis, those are the guests that just seem to knock it out of the park for my show. And you know, those names that I named were great for all the right reasons. But the reality is a lot of times they're just flicking on their microphone and they're just taking things as they come. And they're great on their feet. So they're really good interviews but they don't take the time and the care and put the emphasis on the right parts of the interview all the time. That's why sometimes those B, C, D level entrepreneurs who are, are working their way up to become A levels are sometimes the best guests. John, one of the things that makes you a good interviewer, I've listened to a number of your episodes, is that you balance very well the idea of having a template that you use in interviewing people and at the same time, individualizing the questions. So you're listening. You're not just sitting there with a list of questions that you're just rattling off. You're listening to the answers, responding to the answers. But at the same time, there are some questions that we really do want to hear the answers to from every entrepreneur. What are a few of those? Well, uh, that's one thing that I do really love about the progression of a podcast host and of a broadcaster in general, because I really appreciate your kind words, Tom, but go back and listen to episodes one to 200 and you'll see a very different kind of interviewer myself, you know, who wasn't comfortable asking those questions, who was really focused on the format and the schedule and sticking to that because I didn't have that broadcasting experience. But for the listeners, you know, that's okay because if you want to be, you need to do. So I just had to keep podcasting. And for me, it was seven days a week. So it started to come fairly quickly by doing it every single day. And that naturalness started to come out and that ease and just that comfortness level started to rise. And so my interview skills did as well, because that's so important. But, you know, really to be focused when you're interviewing that guest on what your listener wants to hear, what your avatar, that perfect listener wants to hear. And I know within my interviews, my guests are looking for the overall journey of my guest. And you brought up Mark Sisson, who was a great guest. I wanted to show a side of Mark Sisson that maybe a lot of people hadn't heard. And like with you, and I listened to his great podcast as well, Primal Blueprints, I love hearing about the health and the benefits and different cardio and all this X, Y, Z. But I wanted within my interview format and structure to be bringing out a past failure and really tell that story of the time in, in Mark's life when he just fell flat in his face, but the key lessons that he learned from that. And then moving forward and telling the story about an aha moment that he had and specifically the steps he took to turn that aha moment into success. And then of course we had the lightning round every single episode where I pull out the best advice he's ever had, what held him back from being an entrepreneur, his favorite book, resource, and the $500 question. So those are all things that when my guests press the play button, they know they're going to hear from my guests. They don't know what story is going to come out. They don't know what lessons are going to be taught. They don't know what steps they're going to learn to take an aha moment and turn it into success, but they know they're going to hear those stories. John, looking over all the things you do online, it's like you have a well, an empire of sorts, because you have <laughs> Entrepreneur on Fire, which I urge people to visit, by the way. You can use the shorter version, eofire.com, and of course, subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher, as I'm always badgering you guys to do for this show. But then also, you've got Podcaster's Paradise, you've got Webinar on Fire, Podcast on Fire. You guys have no excuse not to start a show, given all the resources that John Lee Dumas has poured so much sweat <laughs> and tears into creating for you guys. But I want to talk to you about this product, this site you have, called Podcaster's Paradise, because I'm a member myself, guys. All right, so if you want to know how I got to be so fantastic, it's because of this. Well, all right, look, I was podcasting for about a year before I found it, but I've become better. 
since I found this. In fact, <laughs> there's just one, I won't even give it away to people. There's one trick I learned from one of the videos you have at Podcasters Paradise that has already more than paid for the membership just that one thing. So I'll tell you, after we get off, I'll tell you what it was. Yeah, but I'm anyway, hear that. <laughs> yeah, right, but, but anyway, so which came first, the chicken or the egg? Entrepreneur on Fire, your podcast, or Podcasters Paradise, the site that helps people to go from having no podcast at all and not even being sure what to podcast about or how often to podcast to having a flourishing podcast with sponsorships that you can listen to on iTunes? Which came first? So Entrepreneur on Fire precedes Podcasters Paradise by about one year exactly. We actually launched Entrepreneur on Fire in September of 2012 and Podcasters Paradise in October of 2013. But I'll tell you what, Tom, when I launched Entrepreneur on Fire in September of 2012, and if you had told me that in about a year, I would actually be releasing a course in the community that's now grown to over 1,400 members that teaches people how to create, grow, and monetize their podcast, I would have said, that's insanity. Like I barely know how to create my own podcast right now, let alone grow an audience or monetize. You know, I am far, far, far away from that. But within a year, you know, because of the focus, because of just the power of podcasting in general, I was able to grow Entrepreneur on Fire into a six-figure a month business, which then said, you know, I, I feel like I'm ready now to launch this community on how to do just that, create, grow, and monetize your podcast. We launched Podcasters Paradise in October 2013. In year to date, we're over $1.2 million in revenue just for that community alone. Now, l let me share you, uh, with you a little something about my area, which is publishing. I've written a dozen books at this point. I know a lot about the publishing world, and I know there are a lot of people who think they'll write a book, and then they're going to retire on the royalties, and they have no <laughs> idea <laughs> how few copies, especially nonfiction books, sell in the U.S. Now, I've been lucky because I've had some very big-selling books. I've had some turkeys, too. You know, everybody has successes and failures, but in the same way— that I took book publishing and made it into something that I could actually earn an income on. Likewise, podcasting, like book publishing, most people who podcast are not going to earn money from it, and they're not going to get a huge number of listeners. But there is a sliver of them who will do both. How do you, well, how do you advise people then in this situation where they're getting into something that could basically just be a lot of invested time and with, with no return, do you say to them, you have to want to do this in and of itself, and if the monetary uh, reward comes, then all the better? I do in a lot of ways. And the, the reality is, Tom, is that when I look at podcasting, it's an amazing discovery platform. And what I mean by that is if you're running a successful business right now, it is only going to be a pro for you to carve out time in your schedule to create a podcast. You're going to just reach a whole new demographic of the over 525 million access subscribers in iTunes. Believe me, there's a portion of your perfect clients that live in that number. And being a podcaster and having a podcast in those directories allow you to actually connect with potential clients that you would never be able to connect with before. Now, I have not seen a lot of people, and in fact, I was really one of the first to just go whole hog and say, you know what, I'm quitting my job and I am just launching a podcast. And you know, people's number one question is, John, how are you going to monetize? And I said, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm going to build an audience, hopefully a large one, and that audience will tell me how to monetize. And I mean, Tom, for the first nine months post-idea and six months post-launch, there was no revenue being generated whatsoever. And this was my 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. gig. Like I was focusing six, seven days a week on Entrepreneur on Fire. And still, I wasn't able to squeeze a dollar out of it for the first six months. But at the six-month point, I was able to take my audience and start to monetize. And at first, it was just sponsorships and one-on-one -on -one mentorship. And then it grew from there to where I now have consistently over nine streams of income. However, you know, I put in hundreds and thousands of hours just on that with focus just on this for a very long time to get to that point, to reach kind of that tipping point that built that momentum up. For most people, you know, this is just going to be an add to your actual overall business plan, you know, whatever it might be. If you're a, an author or a publisher specifically, I mean, this is just going to be a way for you to potentially get more readers or get your name out there or maybe, you know, 
or raise the eyebrows of, of an editor that you might not have before because you have a show that's out there and is getting listens and you can share those numbers. So podcasting should really be looked at as just an add to what you're doing right now. It shouldn't be the end-all be-all unless you're willing to make it the end-all be-all for a significant amount of time with no return until you know it potentially takes off down the road. So I think it's a great addition to what a lot of people are doing, Tom. But you know, again, that is qualified. Where, like you said, there's always going to be that one percent of rock stars who are just rocking the industry, and then the ninety-nine percent who are hopefully getting some benefit, but not the game-changing, life-changing benefit. Returning, if I may, just to that Mark Sisson interview, you asked him an excellent question after he told you that for the first year of blogging tirelessly. Every single day at MarksDailyApple.com, he was getting 1,000 unique views a day. And then the, by the second year, it was only up to 2,200 unique views a day. Uh, and you asked him, well, at something like, at, wasn't there a time at which you maybe were experiencing self-doubt or you maybe said, maybe this, isn't, maybe this is just too much effort and it's never going to show a return? Well, likewise, in those early months of Entrepreneur on Fire... Did you think to yourself, oh, maybe I'm just a hamster on a wheel and I'm, and I'm never going to get anywhere? <laughs> what made you keep on going? Because I bet there are people who at month four would have stopped doing it. Absolutely. And I definitely had those feelings throughout. It was definitely there. But one thing that I'll tell you that really helped me get through this, and this kind of goes back to the first thing that we talked about today, I've always had a mentor. I've always been a part of a really powerful mastermind. So when I have these doubts, when I have these just fears and these terrors that, you know, why am I doing this? I am on this hamster wheel. I'm able to go to that mentor, to this mastermind and really share with them, you know, what I'm going through and talk it through and really realize that, you know, this is part of the process. And this is something that I talk about a lot, Tom, on Entrepreneur on Fire is that imposter syndrome. And yes, I had it the first day I was supposed to launch my podcast back on August 15th, 2012. And that fear had me delay launch for five weeks. And I would have delayed for even longer than that if it wasn't for my mentor who finally kicked my butt into gear and got me to launch. And every single person is going to experience that imposter syndrome multiple times throughout their journey. You know, months one through month six, there wasn't probably a day that went by that I wasn't like, man, like, is this really going to work? Huge question mark. And even to this day, you know, with all the success that I've had, Tom, I still have those thoughts of, man, like how much longer is this going to work? I mean, this is just so incredible right now. I'm, I'm living a dream. You know, I'm generating over $200,000 in revenue every single month. But, you know, this is, you know, I'm just striking it while the iron is hot. I mean, when is this iron going to cool off? And of course, everything has a cycle. Everything is going to happen. And I just try to focus on living in the now, living in the present, having that support system around me, having that mastermind around me of people that are positive, that you know have experience, that are supporting my growth. And likewise, I'm able to support them through their difficulties. But the overarching theme I want people to take away here is I had those imposter syndrome doubts all throughout my first six months. And it was because of the people around me I was able to get through it and my understanding that the reason I'm having these doubts and these fears is because I'm a human being and humans have doubts. They have fears. That's what's kept us alive all of these, you know, however many thousands of years that we've been, you know, around. And that's very, very powerful of a thought. And if you can embrace that thought, then you can really overcome that. John, let me pull out the uh, million dollar remark <laughs> you made in there. <laughs> and in, in a way, it is literally a million dollar remark. Yeah. Talking about. 200 grand in revenue per month. I mean, you've had a couple of months in a row now with uh, well over $200,000 in gross income. All right, so you had some expenses, but you know, yeah. okay. So, of course, right, you would be saying to yourself, how long can this go on? Although, on the other hand, even if it cooled off 75%, you could probably adapt your lifestyle to 50 grand a month if you absolutely <laughs> had to. You know, so, I mean, you have to feel like, boy, you really have hit on something quite extraordinary. Now, my, my listeners at this point, this is one of the reasons I had John on, not only because he's well-spoken and he knows this stuff backwards and forwards, but also because this is an unbelievable story, and, and their, their jaws are just, just hit the floor when you gave that figure. Now, you mentioned that you've got all these different sources of income because you've, you've worked so hard and you have so many projects, but can you just explain in a nutshell how it's possible for a human being sitting at his computer doing a podcast and making some of these online products available 
to get to a point where you're earning not just slightly into the six figures per month, but extraordinarily into the six figures per month. So there's a really powerful quote that I actually launched the entire Entrepreneur on Fire brand off of. And this was at 32 years old is when I launched Entrepreneur on Fire. And the previous decade of my existence was chasing success. I was going running after success. I went to law school for all the wrong reasons. I quit. I went to, into corporate finance for all the wrong reasons and I quit. Same thing with commercial residential real estate and I quit. And finally, I just realized through reading books and through educating myself and, and this one in particular that it was all about delivering value, not just chasing success. And that quote from Albert Einstein specifically is, try not to become a person of success, but rather become a person of value. And so when I, Tom, was willing to finally just settle down and say, you know what, I'm just going to become a person of value. I'm just going to deliver as much value as I can to grow an audience online that knows, likes, and trusts me. And then I'm going to see what I can do with that audience. And that's the, really the key word these days when you say like, you know, a guy that's sitting at his computer in my living room here in San Diego, how can I generate that kind of revenue? I mean, there will be weeks that go by that I don't like leave a mile radius of where I'm at right now. And the only reason I'm even leaving the like 400 square foot radius of my little office area here sometimes is to go outside for a run. And the reality is, is that because I've been able to build a large audience, I've been able to ask that audience one killer question. What is the one thing you are struggling with most right now? And then just shut up and listen. And their responses are pure gold, Tom. They're telling me their pain points, their obstacles, their struggles, their challenges. I'm listening. I'm taking all of this in. And then I'm creating the solution for them in ways of products and services. And we've talked about two of them already a couple times. So I was hearing people's pain points saying, John, like I have a message. I have a brand that I want to promote. I have you know, a voice that I want to share with the world. But how do I create my podcast? How do I actually grow? into a larger audience once I have. And like, how do I actually start making some revenue from that? And that light bulb went off and I said, well, it's time for me to create a community called Podcasters Paradise where I can teach people how to do just that, create, grow, and monetize their podcast. And everything within the community, Tom, is all from that question that I asked and those answers that I got, those obstacles and struggles that people were having that I turned into over 200 video tutorials that I turned into monthly webinars with today's top podcasters answering those questions, a monthly Q&A session with me, and then also this private and thriving Facebook group where the over 1,400 members of Podcasters Paradise can engage, support, give each other feedback, hold each other accountable every single minute of every single day. And that's what Podcasters Paradise is. And it all came from that initial first question. And this is going to be a really kind of interesting lead forward from this because this is really powerful how you can just see how businesses can go forward from that because I had no idea like how we were going to do with Podcasters Paradise. I knew there were going to be a lot of initial sales, but then I was like, well, how's that going to go looking forward? Well, we realized that with the $1,297 price point that Podcasters Paradise is, just a sales page isn't going to be enough for a lot of people. So let's do live webinars, podcast workshops, we call them, where we teach people on these live webinars how to create, grow, and monetize, and then open the door for them into Paradise if they want to join. And we started doing 91% of our sales into Podcasters Paradise on those live webinars. So people started asking us then, Tom, well, John, how are you creating and presenting these webinars that are converting so gosh darn well? And then another light bulb went off and said, well, there's another product. These are a pain point and an obstacle that a lot of my clients are having. Why not create webinar on fire to do just that? Teach people how to create and present webinars that convert. And we're now almost at 300 members of webinar on fire with over $150,000 in sales and just launched a handful of months ago. So that built off of the Podcasters Paradise brand, all from that initial first powerful question. Well, I know you're, you're uh, out of time, so I want to urge people to check out, of course, eofire.com, Entrepreneur on Fire. For those of you who say there isn't enough woods on the air, well, now you have Dumas <laughs> for your ride home. I want you to check that out. Also, podcastersparadise.com. If you're serious about doing this and jumping in and you want step-by-step, -step, how do I go from zero to a thriving podcast, 
That's the place to be, podcastersparadise.com. I can tell you that from my own personal experience. John Lee Dumas, thanks so much for your time today. We appreciate it. Tom, it has been a blast. Thank you, my friends. Okay, everybody, a few quick announcements before we get going. I'll tell you what's coming up tomorrow in just a second. You guys know I'm redesigning my site, making it more user-friendly, and I'm taking the podcast site and blending it in with my tomwoods.com. And once that's all done, I'm actually going to have a resource page where I'm going to be linking to all these useful resources that we talk about on this program. For example, Podcaster's Paradise. I would put that up on my resources page. So eventually that will be at tomwoods.com slash resources. This Saturday, October 25th, I'm going to be in Boise, Idaho, and make sure and save the date January 24th in Houston, Texas, with Ron Paul, Lou Rockwell, and others. Details at tomwoods.com slash events. Of course, the big news right now in Woodsland is the release of my latest book, my 12th, Real Descent, A Libertarian Sets Fire to the Index Card of Allowable Opinion. The first book I've ever self-published, just as an experiment. Why not? Let's give it a shot. I personally think it's the best book uh, I've written, as a matter of fact. I think it's the best thing I've done. It covers a lot of different topics that are of interest to libertarians, but it's got my usual series of responses and smackdowns of bad guys and all that sort of thing that you guys enjoy or you wouldn't be listening to this program. But if you know someone you're, whose mind you're trying to change and you seem to be hitting a brick wall or there's some question, whether it's war or the Federal Reserve or all these sorts of issues that we talk about quite a bit, where you're a little bit fuzzy or you're being cornered, you don't know how to answer some of the arguments that are being made, then Real Dissent is for you. I think you're going to enjoy it. It's punchy prose, but full of information you can use in your own debates and discussions. So check that out over at realdescent.com, and you can get the free audiobook version with me reading it at tomwoodsaudio.com. Now, speaking of the Fed, we hear a lot about ending the Fed. End the Fed, people say. But what then, people want to know. What would happen if you did end the Fed? What would replace it? Well, that's a good question. Would anything replace it? What kind of system would exist in its absence? That's the question we're going to answer tomorrow with Professor Jeff Herbener, Department Chairman of Economics at Grove City College in Grove City, Pennsylvania. Not to be missed, so make sure you have subscribed to the show on iTunes or Stitcher so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks for listening, everybody. See you tomorrow. The Tom Woods Show.